Prospect House Media. And now, prepare yourself for the only weekly podcast you won't want to miss. Welcome to the Ameritocracy Show with Troy Edgar, live from our studios in Los Angeles and Washington, D.C. Hey, everybody. I am Troy Edgar, and welcome to the Ameritocracy Show. Thank you for tuning in and checking it out. It is greatly appreciated. This podcast examines the conditions for personal and professional growth and opportunity across America. This week, I met with former California State Senator John Morlock in our LA studio. John served over 25 years in elected office until 2021 in the roles of Orange County Treasurer, County Supervisor, and State Senator. Prior to elected office, John was a CPA and an accounting partner for over 19 years. John rose to prominence in 1994 when he noticed the county's financial problems and tried to warn officials, but was largely ignored. Later that year, Orange County, California declared bankruptcy, the largest municipality to fail in U.S. history. His voice in finance gained global attention and less than four months later, John was appointed the Orange County Treasurer. We also discussed his ongoing efforts since leaving elected office to improve financial management in California. John closed on his thoughts for the future of the state and the need for more balanced approach to budgeting and spending. I hope you enjoy. Good afternoon, John, how are you doing? Good, Troy. It's good to see you. It's a real honor to see you again. Yeah, the yeah. Beard's looking great. Oh, <laughs> but never as good as Sean Warlock's beard. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, it's been a while since you and I've been together, um, but we've shared a lot of history together. And I'm very honored to have you on the show today. So I really appreciate it. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. So uh, for the audience, uh, you know, your background a little bit, and we'll kind of have you tell your story, but, uh, you know, just kind of put it out there as a you know, former treasurer uh, within the Orange County, California. And then uh, you moved on from uh, the treasurer to the county supervisor, supervisor to the state senate. Um, and, uh, you know, just a lot of history. And I, th- I think why this episode is very special for me is in 2005 or six, when I decided to go to public service and you know, serve while trying to be a corporate guy, um, you know, one of our mutual friends connected us and uh, you were pretty tough in the beginning to, you know, make sure that I was doing it for the right reasons, uh, public service. And then um, once you were convinced it was an ongoing task, but you very slowly, once you get behind people, you're very supportive and you're a great mentor. So um, I wanted to talk a little bit about that today. Um, and then probably... Um, Bigger picture is, you know, something that I think was the calling card. I remember when I've met you was back in 1994. You had uh, basically uh, you were attending county supervisor meetings and saying, hey, this county's got a financial problem. And uh, you eventually uh, declared that there was going to be a problem. And eventually the county went bankrupt. And at that time, one of the largest bankruptcies in the United States and uh, like to maybe break that down a little bit. Um, something we try to do on the show too is like, how can you do what you do professionally and also try to make a difference? And thought that would be really good. So um, with that, uh, what I thought, uh, if you wouldn't mind, is just explain a little bit about your background and uh, kind of take us from the beginnings uh, that really kind of grinds you into uh, kind of your, your knowledge of California and kind of where you started the real perspective, if you wouldn't mind. No, no, no. Now that I know I have a couple hours to do that. (laughs) Um, Grew up in Orange County, uh, actually born in the Netherlands. My folks immigrated in 1960, but uh, went through uh, the local education uh, system and uh, went to Long Beach State. Uh, There uh, I majored uh, in accounting with a Bachelor of uh, Science and one of my classmates was working for a CPA in Costa Mesa and said that uh, the little soul practice was uh, actually growing. And so I said, well, here's my name and phone number. And, you know, and I got hired. Uh, so I uh, started 
uh, working for a CPA, you know, before I finished college around 78, 1978, and just sort of enjoyed, you know, being an accountant and studying for the CPA, also enjoying California historical landmarks. It was one of those funny things, uh, since you alluded to it, uh, my father being from Holland, uh, spent his winters uh, skiing in the Alps. Mm. So my dad enjoyed snow skiing, so that's what we did, right? Uh, Mount Baldy locally, and we would go up to Mammoth, and on the 395, you'd see these beige signs, historical landmark 500 feet ahead. And I'd say to my dad, let's let's pull over, check it out. You know, dad's, no, no, we're, we're going to, we got to get to the slopes, man. We- <laughs> <laughs> right. So when I was studying for the CPA exam, I wrote the state, uh, and said, yeah, you have a book or some something? What do I do to find all these landmark plaques? And, and so a- after I sat for the exam, then I went up 395 to do a little backpacking mm. and started visiting these landmarks, you know, little Instamatic, mm. you know, camera little, and, and, and started building, uh, you know, an album of these photos. And it just kind of w- w- kept going. Uh, uh, so even, even on my honeymoon in 1980, I... We went to historical landmarks, <laughs> stayed at the Del Coronado. I mean, it was oh, just wow. sort of a cornball kind of thing. But uh, uh, enjoyed the practice, uh, married, raising kids, became a partner in 1984, um, you know, built a practice, was having fun. Uh, but when we bought a house in 1984 and across the street in Costa Mesa uh, were uh, neighbors that were involved in the local Republican Assembly, mm-hmm. uh, which was a, a, a statewide organization, and and so the first, you know, uh, event we had in our new neighborhood was a potluck for Christmas for the Republican Club in in town. So you know, did that. You know, it was a member, but I was pretty busy. You know, building a practice, being a dad, uh, and and just sort of somewhere, you know, started working my way up the chairs. Uh, by 1992. Uh, two of the local assembly members, uh, Nolan Frizzell and Gil Ferguson, said, you ought to run for central committee, which is an organizing body that each county has. Every uh, party has their own central committee. So so in, in 92, there were 24 candidates running for six seats. And I told my wife that night, wouldn't it be cool, you know, to make it to top 10, you know, just, you know, never run for office before. Mm-hmm. Uh, but when the, when the vote was over, I was in sixth place. So I, I was on the central committee, became the assistant treasurer, of course. And, and then uh, a, a couple years later, the chair of the party said, you know, you ought to run for treasurer. And I'm going, no, assistant treasurer is fine. <laughs> and, and, they're go, and they said, he said, no, 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 we're talking, you know, Robert L. Bob Citron, you know, county treasurer. And, and I just did not react well <laughs> to that. It was like, I am so tired of being treasurer. <laughs> You know, I want to be the marketing guy or something, you know, <laughs> different. Because I do accounting yeah. all day long. You yeah. know, it's like, uh, but I did some research and and started digging in uh, to the the records that were available. And and Mr. Citron was uh, recognized as one of the best treasurers in earning high returns, and that was done through the use of leverage. So if you have uh, the ability to, say, borrow for 90 days or 180 days at 3%, but you can buy a four-year bond paying 5%, now you're making 200 basis points more, mm. and you're a genius. you know. But uh, I said that won't work if the short end of the yield curve goes above the amount that you're earning. So in other words, if if you all of a sudden find yourself paying 5% and you got to re-up every three to six months, you're now making zero. And if you have to pay more, you're upside down and it's an alligator. And and he also used something that was rather new or not as well-known 30 years ago to the general public. He was using derivatives, which are based on formulas and he was using uh, inverse floaters, which means that uh, if interest rates go down, the yield goes up for the for the instrument. So everything was a, a major bet on interest rates staying level or going down at the short end, and uh, that uh, that that was 
pretty much my campaign. I can ask you though. So Citron was the county treasurer uh, for quite a while up to that point. So this guy was established. Um, you know, um, some of our political friends. I remember when I looked at different races to run in. They're like, you don't ever go after an incumbent unless there's a reason. Um, this guy did have a reputation, like you said, and, and it wasn't only just the county as being a good treasurer, the state and the nation, like he had the highest returns. Uh, so this is kind of what you're up against at right. that point. Okay. So at, 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 at you start doing this research at, at the beginning. Was it just really trying to understand what his strategy was or were you starting to see flaws? Because what, what I remember, and you you can you know clarify this, is like he started pushing really big bets into this, and you know, and almost like getting very confident and kind of over his skis. Is that what you started to see? Right. You you point out one thing, and, and at the time, thirty years ago, they did a, a study of um, how well women did in uh, getting elected, and and what the data showed, it, it didn't matter whether you were male or female. What really mattered was were you the incumbent. Because incumbents won elections 90% of the yeah. time. Uh, that was one of the barriers. Another barrier was what we call name ID. If you want to run for office, it's good to, you know, have name ID. Be, mm -hmm. and, and so what Mr. Citron did is he had everyone write their property tax payments because you're also the tax collector. Mm -hmm. So twice a year, people are writing a check to Robert L. Bob Citron. Oh. Some... Uh, I ran into some property owners that had a lot of properties mm -hmm. and they have a rubber stamp, you know, back exactly. then when you actually mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. wrote checks and sent them, sent them in. So uh, I even called uh, the treasure tax collector of San Diego County. His name was Paul Boland. And he said, you could run against him, but you're not going to beat him because mm -hmm. we have everybody write their checks out to us. And we do that for a reason, young man. <laughs> and so that was sort of on my business plan. You can run against him, but you're not going to beat him. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing that was really fascinating is that uh, the reason I was recruited, sort of are asked, mm -hmm. is that Mr. Citron was the only Democrat that was in elected office at the county level. And at that time, even at the state and federal level, all mm -hmm. of the elected officials for Orange County were, were Republicans, except mm -hmm. for Bob Citron. And so uh, that should have been a, like a layup, you know, kind of a slam dunk or mm -hmm. conservative county. If I run, I should be fine. Uh, but even the five Republican supervisors endorsed Mr. Citron because he was generating so much money in interest income. We're talking over $100 million mm -hmm. a year that, that it was helping the county during a recession to balance their budget. And so the chairman of the board, Tom Riley, a retired uh, general, uh, Marine general, I believe, uh, he would be quoted in the Los Angeles Times as saying, you know, we don't know how in the hell he does it, mm. but he makes us all look good. Mm. And so it was, a, it was a big uphill climb. Um, what made it even more interesting is as you try to point things out, um, people would, would call the rating agencies. So Standard & Poor's would be called and... Uh, the the representative, her name was Diane Brosen, said, you know, what he's doing doesn't give us any concern. Mm -hmm. I had reporters that were not uh, business reporters. Mm -hmm. And so they just thought, oh, it's a Republican versus Democrat. And, you know, he's just, you know, making noise, yada, yada. Um, but what was interesting is that, um, you know, when people tell you the truth and you don't really, you know, you're not, you just... Yeah. You just go, no, you're not, that's, that's not true. That's, mm -hmm. You know, it's like like the Gospels, you know, <laughs> here's Jesus healing yeah. everybody. Yeah. And he's not the Messiah, you know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. It's a sort of, it's you know, kind of an interesting paradigm where you're trying to convince people. So I find myself laying in bed at night, looking at the ceiling. Okay, okay, Lord, what is going yeah. on? Why is this so obvious to me, a finance person, accountant? Mm -hmm. you know, but why is no one getting it? Yeah. And, and so... Uh, we kept we kept trying uh, the Wall Street Journal uh, weighed in. I mean, they don't do local elections. So here I am on page C1 of the Wall Street Journal. <laughs> I mean, I could die, you know, yeah. I had accomplished what everybody would want to do. Um, and and they're, they're laying it all out. Derivatives, royal, uh, you know, uh, county election and, and campaign and uh, and the bond buyer, which is another national publication, covered it. 
uh, but it just it just wasn't somehow resonating. But for a nobody with no name ID, with a press that was very antagonistic, uh, with everybody endorsing uh, the incumbent, mm-hmm. uh, I, I still got 40% roughly of the vote, which is not too bad. As mm-hmm. you know, yeah. you've run for office and, yeah. you know, getting 40% is First the, time the, out. the yeah. message was, res- you know, yeah. it was starting to get some traction, uh, but I lost. And mm-hmm. so I was, you know, I was the loser. Can I ask you, John? So you and I have sat and chaired things. You were the chair of the Orange County Supervisors, uh, Board of Supervisors. And you get up there and public comment opens at the beginning and people get up there. Some of them are well-meaning. Some of them are eccentric um, and, and you know, are, are not following stuff, but they really are saying stuff. And, you know, we call some of those folks gadflies. And, um, you know, and so on top of you running for office, you've now raised your profile in the county um, and to what, you know, when a politician, I'll just say a mayor, sees somebody constantly coming at them you know, it's like all oh, those gadflies. And and so it's almost like it's a nuisance. Um, it's a branding that somebody can really kind of stick to you. So the one thing an election does is it actually claims history, right? And so it, it's like this guy ran, there's nothing here. So did, did you just let it go and then it just kind of gestated or did you continue to pursue it and, and be looked at as like a poor loser? Uh, when I ran, it was uh, the June election cycle. And you you had to, I had to run during tax season. Oh. So I'm a partner in a firm. I have a client base, which keeps me there, mm-hmm. you know, all day long, all the hours. And so I was running a campaign on top of running a business. Uh, tax season's over. I, I write a, a letter to the Board of Supervisors. It's like March 31st, May 31st, excuse me. And, and it says, here's like eight pages of here's what your treasure's doing. And here's what's going to happen if interest rates keep rising. So I lose the election, and Alan Greenspan, who was the president of the Federal Open Market Committee, the Federal Reserve, uh, he still raises interest rates. Something we've just recently seen again uh, with uh, with uh, the Federal Reserve Board, and and so I'm kind of like um, my my skin is like crawling off my body. I'm just like you know <laughs> it's just like oh no another twenty five percent and twenty five basis increase. And so I'm trying to reach out to anybody saying, you know, rates are still rising. Yeah. You know, this, is this has got to be a mess, you know, every, and, and so uh, I write a letter to the publisher of the Orange County Register. So I said, you know, they had a campaign um, on billboards, on bus stations, bus, bus stops, excuse me, and a big poster and so-and-so doesn't get it. You know, it's like, mm-hmm. you know, you should be subscribing to the register if you don't get it. And so I, I wrote and I said, you guys don't get it. <laughs> I said, you're, you're, our, our portfolio is now down at least $1.2 billion. I mean, and you guys haven't figured it out. And I talked to Ken Grubbs, who was the editorial page editor. We bumped into each other in November at election night. Mm-hmm. And he said, yeah, we got your letter. We were bemused. And that was... That was the depth. I mean, mm-hmm. one of the supervisors uh, who just passed away recently, William Steiner, great guy. But when I saw him during the campaign, he he said, "What you what your observation?" He says, "Yeah, talk to Mr. Citron. He's really annoyed that you're running against him." And that was it. It yeah. wasn't like, "Hey, John, can we sit down yeah. and chat? You know what what's bugging you? What yeah. what are you seeing that I should be seeing?" And and, and they and they went on and they borrowed tons of money during the summer into the fall so that Mr. Citron could, you know, keep his scheme going because yeah. he yeah. had to have enough equity to to, to, to uh, be the uh, adequate for collateral yeah. for all of his, his borrowings to invest. So it got really interesting. Uh, by Thanksgiving, uh, we got a call. Hey, now this is Thanksgiving after you, this, your election. After I lost. This is so just this November. now a year, a year late? No, just a few months. A few mu- okay. A few months. Yeah. By November... Um, I get a call, hey, Citron's meeting with all the pool participants, mm. kind of explain what's what's going on. And and we're talking the end of November. Got it. And then early December, it all comes out. And they do press conferences. The, the, the country goes nuts, you know, literally. I was mm. on the phone with reporters from 8 a.m. to midnight every day. It was just 
all over the world. Mm -hmm. It was just an amazing experience. And by December 6, the Board of Supervisors decides to file for Chapter 9 bankruptcy, wow. which is the uh, the municipal version of Chapter 11 mm -hmm. for corporations. And then uh, then that just just became you know international news. Uh, I'm on I'm on I'm working I'm on the phone all the I get a call from one of my friends who's in business and he says Don I'm I'm calling you from Jakarta Indonesia <laughs> you're on CNN what's going on back home what's mm. you know mm. and so uh, it's just sort of funny because here I am 29 years uh, later and I'm uh, I I couldn't read all the newspapers because I'm a big newspaper reader. I read them every day, and if I don't get to it, I put it on the pile, and I, yeah. I do the LIFO thing, last in, first out. So I'm now down to 95, mm. and I'm reading all these articles, and there's these two big sections in the paper. At the front page, big stories, O.J. Simpson, the trial, mm -hmm. and Orange County, the bankruptcy. <laughs> it's yeah. just amazing to see how big the story became. So, yeah, I had my little... Andy Warhol, 15 <laughs> minutes of fame. Can I ask you, John, so the you know, the election, just to set the sequence, um, you were talking about would have been May-June, the normal primary when they do the county stuff. Since he won over 50 percent, he, he won it then. So he didn't go into the November. And then November comes, Thanksgiving, bad time for everything. Chapter 11 in December. Chapter go, 9. Or chapter 9. When, when that happens... What's, what do you think? Are you thinking, you know, okay, I told you so. Or are you thinking, you know, and I may have a chance to be treasurer again. How, how does this thing start to take procedural action? At Because I would think at the board, too, the board is a little complicit. Now Now it's not just they just can't let the treasurer ride this one by themselves. They, they, they're, you know, everybody's on this train now. Yeah, lots of memories mm -hmm. rushing back, Troy. But around October, I wrote... Uh, I had about six, um, in, uh, they were bond traders. Um, when you work for an investment house, Merrill Lynch, mm -hmm. a bad example, but mm -hmm. Goldman Sachs, um, th th their public relations officer, they don't want you in the newspaper. Right. You know, you, 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 can, you can get, you lose your job. And so they helped me out, but anonymously. Mm -hmm. But they all came to the same conclusion. And, and I used that research when I ran against them and I, pay, and I put that eight-page letter together or whatever. Um, but in October, I wrote them all and said, we're, we're, we're going to have to come in. We're going to have to help mm -hmm. with the situation. It's getting worse. Uh, because in November, Greenspan raised interest rates 75 basis points. That's a big, big number because for the last what, 15 years, interest rates have been zero. Yeah. We haven't seen this. We've yeah. just kind of seen uh, a flat line. So uh, it was one of those things where I was like, oh, we better get ready. Mm -hmm. You know, What I didn't know is that some of the people I reached out for, to uh, who, that had access to the supervisors were actually lobbyists for Merrill Lynch, which was the key player in helping Citron borrow to invest. Mm. Uh, and what I, yeah, other things I didn't know is that the uh, county realized that things were getting a little awkward. The CAO at the time, the chief administrative officer, they retained a firm out of New York City to, to do analysis of the pool, mm -hmm. which I had already done for free, mm -hmm. but they got paid $500,000, you know? Wow. And then when the whole thing broke, then I'm on the phone with reporters day in, day out, and I'm being asked to speak everywhere. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm doing... Mm -hmm. Interviews, it's just, yep. you know, nonstop craziness. And, and I'm not billing. I'm a billable. I yeah. bill, I, I, I earn my living by billable time. I'm a, <laughs> right. I'm a time slave. Yeah. And, and, and I'm going, wait, these knuckleheads, they pay someone 500000 and I probably lost 500000 Where's <laughs> You know, it's, it's just yeah. really like real, yeah. real frustrating. But, but try to, try to, you know, answer all the questions. And, you know, it, it was interesting, you know, to, to deal with the New York Times to, Der Spiegel to, mm -hmm. you know, but then it was, okay, uh, are they going to, what are they going to do with me? You know, I was the guy outside. Um, I was the guy that called it. Mm -hmm. So I, 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 you know, use the word gadfly. Yeah. 
is that we don't we don't want this guy in here. You know, yeah. he, he made yeah. us all look bad. We're yeah. all five supervisors are, are being hounded. Please resign, you know. Yeah. And so it was a real interesting time. The supervisors uh, pulled in a gentleman by the name of Tom Daxon, who was going to be helping Governor Keating out of Oklahoma as his finance director. Mm -hmm. So he said, you got to you got me for a few months. And I, I and and and, it, and, and I kind of said, you know, I could work for you or I couldn't. I'm I'm partner in a firm. I'm, mm -hmm. you know, I'm doing OK. Yeah. Uh, not that, I, you know, it's I'm not a, a super millionaire, but it isn't like I need the job at, at the county. But but I'm here if mm -hmm. you need me, because I have been eating, sleeping, drinking <laughs> treasure for over a year now. And the L.A. Times then did a poll and 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 they found that 50 percent of those asked said I should be the next treasurer. Mm -hmm. So that put a lot of pressure on on the board of supervisors. Uh, but then they hired Bill Popejoy to be the CEO. And he's going, no, we should go and do a national search. And so I, 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 it just turned out that finally the four of the supervisors said, you know, even if we did a national search, we'll probably appoint Morlock. Mm. You know, what's, yeah. what's the point? Of, you know, so they put together a, a committee. I was interviewed mm -hmm. and then I was uh, appointed on March 17th of 1995. Wow. Okay. And thank you for letting me bring that all up because I don't like yeah. to talk about it so much. It's just kind no, of bizarre. No, I think it's, it's, it's fascinating. I think, um, you know, it's it's hard that, uh, you know, you kind of have to face the, the people that uh, in every different direction were not fully on board with you. And then eventually they kind of come around um, and, and eventually you need to work with you, you know, and, and being able to kind of go through. And so, um, you know, I think, your ability to kind of overcome that just from, because there had to be emotions. Like, like you said, it was real money to you uh, being able to go through. Did you find anybody inside the county or one of the supervisors that you eventually kind of help Sherpa you into that or give you some guidance or be your, your kind of, um, you know, the, the first person that was able to reach out and actually kind of pull you into the fold? Um. They were all kind of uh, shell shocked, and they were just getting just you know mm -hmm. shot at from every every direction. They were told they should resign. Uh, the district attorney started to investigate them all. Um, it was really interesting. Uh, two of them were actually uh, gone by uh, the end of December. Mm -hmm. uh, Thomas Riley and and Harriet Weeder, because they termed there was the end of their terms. Mm -hmm. Uh, Marion Bergeson replaced Riley. Jim Silva replaced uh, Weeder. Uh, Vasquez, Stanton, and Steiner were still there. Okay. Uh, they they voted for me. Mm -hmm. It was it was unanimous, mm -hmm. and it was it was nice. Mm -hmm. um, even uh, someone like uh, Marion Bergeson, uh, when I ran for uh, in the campaign in the, in the beginning of the year, uh, she was one of my two campaign co-chairs, honorary, mm -hmm. you know, the other was Congressman Chris Cox. And about April, uh, she called me in and she says, I I'm going to have to withdraw my support for your campaign. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was like, Marion, um, I think this is going to blow up. And when it does, and you're going to be the supervisor, uh, this is going to be really awkward. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I don't think it's a good idea that you back out. Mm -hmm. um, and she's, and I tried to explain everything yeah. to her. And no, she backed out. Now, did I get reimbursed for my lost stationery? <laughs> no. Right. Because <laughs> I held the letterhead, yeah. you know. But Chris Cox, for years, kept kept the fact that he was my yeah. sole now yeah. campaign yeah. chair. That was on his website on the wow. in Congress for years. It was really. But, but even Marion sort of realized, you know, one thing she came up to me, you know, because we'd see each other at events or, mm -hmm. or TV programs or mm -hmm. whatever. She says, you know, John, the first question every reporter asks me mm -hmm. is why did you withdraw your endorsement for Morlock? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I get it every, every time. And, and so she at least understood, you know, that I had, you know, I had been honest and I told the truth mm -hmm. and I had, you know, I was just trying to be professional the whole way through, uh, but and and you had mentioned this, but but never once, never once did I say I told you so. Yeah. Um, there was a reporter that, uh, not a reporter, but a columnist for the Register, uh, Melissa Balmain, 
and she called me and and she said, you know, she said, I've, I've reread all our articles. I mean, you spelled it all out. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was, you, you said everything mm-hmm. and, and I'm just trying to figure out, um, you know, how we missed it. Mm-hmm. And she was a columnist. And this was December 6th. This was right after the county filed for bankruptcy. I'm still at the office. And um, I said, yeah, you know, I, I even wrote your publisher, mm-hmm. you know. She said, could you fax that letter to me? And I said, yeah. And so it's like 10 o'clock at night. And I'm putting the letter through the fax machine. I'm getting emotional here. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm standing here. And I said, oh, Lord. I said, we tried to tell everybody. Mm. And now my county is in bankruptcy. Mm. I started bawling. Troy, I, you know, yeah. we're men. Yep. You know, we hold back tears. You know, sniffle a little bit. But I started bawling. I mean, I was, I was all by myself, yeah. and I'm trying to stop. It's like, but but my body is like convulsing, and I am, I have never had this experience before or after, and I can't stop. I I cannot get my body to stop wailing. Mm-hmm. I call my wife. <laughs> I can't stop crying. She, she says, "Come home." Oh, I can't drive like this. <laughs> yeah, it was bizarre. Yeah, but it was. You know, it's like that one of those God things where you just kind of felt like, oh, yeah, all this emotion, all this, all everything that I've been going through, it just kind of got released. And the next morning, uh, you know, I'm on, I'm on. Well, I think I, I was uh, Ron and Sana. I can't remember who he was with, but he's interviewing me, and I said, you know, this is this is so tragic, mm-hmm. and uh, so, but but it, it was very therapeutic yeah. and. And 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 I, it, it let me be free to, to 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 just not be antagonistic, but just to be there. And if they needed me, fine. If they didn't, fine. Um, yeah, you know, John, it's interesting. This that um, you know, certain times I know in my life, you reach a point where you know, you you almost feel like your purpose is manifested. Like it, it might be the sadness for the county, or it might be the the reality that like you're being used for a higher purpose and that, you know, the, you know, the county would have been in even worse condition if it would have caught everybody flat footed. And so I, I think, you know, and I, I, I think that that is probably one of the most important things uh, through this interview so far is that, you know, being able to, to have the humility, like you said, and kind of share that level, because I think a lot of people um, are always trying to search, like, what is my purpose? Why, why is it, you know, I'm doing all this stuff, you know, your family is losing money, you know, you're, you tried to do something. I mean, you and I, yeah, you know, just to kind of tell a a losing story in 2012, when I ran for state assembly, you were a big supporter, and you kind of cautioned me, and I lost. And I remember, I had to go to a, um, I, the the week after I lost, I, I had to do the city luncheon for the mayor's lunch in LaSalle. And I think you had come to, you know, you would come to all the, the city functions and got up on stage. And, you know, I'm, I remember talking to my wife and saying, God, it's going to be hard getting up on stage after you just had this public loss, spent $700,000. I mean, there, there was, you know, you're, it, it hurts. And I remember you got up on stage and said, hey, well, here's the biggest loser, Troy, or something. And you made a comment to me. And I was like, oh, my God, the biggest loser. And and, and, um, and it was funny as that um, I think that, that was character building. Like, I I didn't appreciate it at the time. But then, you know, I felt like, okay, that I had to go through that. And it's just, I think your story is similar. Hey, context to the, the bankruptcy. So at that time in the nation, you know, after that, Detroit, you know, eventually has a bankruptcy problem. Um, there's a couple other cities out there that, uh, um, you know. Jefferson County. Yeah, in Alabama. Uh, Alabama. Yeah, and so, you know, now you're kind of in a, I won't say a, a four-seers club, but definitely you're a voice. And I remember even when I ran for office 2006, um, you know, your brand was a lot of things, but it definitely – financial brand was there all those things that you're talking about the interviews the reporting um you know now you do have name recognition now you do have name id and then now you have a platform to actually use it you know if you kind of keep going past the bankruptcy you ended up running for county supervisor 
and you know, and you, uh, a lot of effort and a lot of great things that you did there. What, what was your most memorable point once you got into the county supervisor? Because um, eventually you got to kind of switch gears out of the finance stuff to a much higher cause of multiple types of issues there. And uh, I was just kind of curious that experience for you. Well, um, uh, it was interesting. Uh, I was uh, also, as a treasurer, you're automatically uh, the ninth member on the board of the uh, retirement system, the Orange County Employees mm -hmm. Retirement System. And um, we got this request from the Board of Supervisors to uh, see whether or not they should be offering a, a new pension formula for the sheriffs. Mm -hmm. uh, and they called it 3% at 50. Mm -hmm. Currently, the sheriffs were receiving 2% at 50. And, and they asked, well, we'd like the research to see if we could afford to do 3% at 50. And I thought, and that, that's 75000 a year. Well, it was a year after 9-11, and all of a sudden, they snuck it on the board agenda to adopt 3% at 50. And that started me on a whole different crusade. Of, you know, I just got angry. And, yeah. you know, when you get angry, you get motivated. Mm -hmm. And so I started saying, wait a second, this is unsustainable. What made it even more frightening is that they didn't make it effective prospectively. They made it effective to the data higher. So all you had to do was wait for the board vote. And instead of making 50000 a year, if you would have waited until it was approved, you'd be making 75000 wow. a year. And so we were 100% funded because of the dot-com boom. Yep. But you you improve benefits by 50%, and all of a sudden you're two-thirds funded. Yep. And this is 1999, 2000, 2001. Was, and, and here we are almost a quarter century later, and the, and the system is still... 71% mm -hmm. fun. I mean, it's like mm -hmm. still at two thirds. It's just really been, been kind of crazy. But just, I had a lot of fun as treasurer for 12 years, yeah. implementing things local and statewide. And, but, but when I saw that these guys didn't understand finances, I kind of thought I, I should be a supervisor mm -hmm. and, and I should get on that dais to at least debate. I may mm -hmm. lose the votes, but I could at least debate and say, you guys gotta, I gotta mm -hmm. give math lessons. So yeah, I ran, uh, for, uh, uh, treasurer, I mean, sure, for a supervisor, but uh, the, the deputy sheriffs knew that I was not happy. And so they raised their dues and they raised, they raised a candidate to oppose me. Uh, but I won anyway. I mm -hmm. did, did real well. But yeah, we made some changes. We, 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 we came to the conclusion that granting a, a, a pension increase like this created a debt mm -hmm. and you don't encumber uh, uh, taxpayers with a debt unless they've approved it with a two-thirds vote. Right. And that's in the state constitution in two places. So we uh, filed lawsuit against the deputy sheriff's union. Mm -hmm. <laughs> kind of a, my, my, my youngest son at the time said, dad, I just read something from John Wayne. It, it says courage is being really scared, but getting on the horse anyway. <laughs> and I said, okay, that's sort of what I need to, to hear today. <laughs> So, you know, because when you sue a union where every member carries a firearm, it's kind of, <laughs> kind of scary. Uh, right. So we, we did that and um, we, we, we said you, you can't grant retroactive because mm -hmm. you haven't been setting funds aside for it. Uh, so we worked on that. We worked on retiree medical. We were able to reduce an unfunded liability uh, by a uh, billion dollars from 1.4 to 400 million. We were able to uh, implement new tiers for new hires. Uh, we, we, were, we, were, we did things that Jerry Brown and I, we, we met and mm -hmm. discussed uh, when he was attorney general. When he became governor, he, you know, I, we, we met again. I said, what are you going to do about these pensions? And he says, don't worry, I'll get to it. And he did the Personal Retirement Act, the PEPRA. Mm -hmm. uh, and he incorporated some of my stuff. You no know, retroactive benefits, yeah. uh, new tiers for new hires. He, he, you know, so my fingerprints were there, but... We, we, we had a lot of fun addressing financial issues as supervisor, which did not make me, you know, the, the favorite elected official <laughs> of public employee unions. So uh, a little bit of context and because uh, we'll, uh, we'll kind of even go to when you were in the Senate. But uh, so county supervisor within Orange County, five supervisors, five supervisor districts. Uh, the district you had was kind of North Orange County, which was uh, including uh, Los Alamitos, where I was at. And, um, you know. Having somebody that was on the county board, you know, as, as a as a mayor or city council member, 
you know, when you're trying to get money for your city or trying to get focus and support, you know, having the county supervisor of the, the, the state assembly person for the area, the state senator and the Congress. Um, so at, at that point, when you first got on, it was a really powerful um, group to be able to kind of get a lot done for, for North Orange County. I would be remiss to not mention the story when you were a supervisor um, 2008, um, my wife and I are getting married and uh, I end up... Um, you know, at the county hall, kind of the city hall, but the county hall, uh, an, an older building kind of looks a little bit uh, like a pyramid. And it's got uh, it's kind of weird. Down, no upside pyramid. down. Upside yeah. down pyramid. Um, <laughs> you had a uh, office overlooking the parking lot. And I said, hey, um, my wife and I are going to get married and we need to come down to the uh, uh, county clerk recorder and do the justice of the peace. And I was going to uh, have a ceremony locally in Orange County. And uh you're like, hey, Troy, call me when you get here. He goes, I'll take, you'll take care of it. You could do justice of the peace and, um, you know, we'll take care of the official part of this. And so he said, text me when you get in the parking lot. And so I go, hey, Betty, uh, you know, John said to text him. So we get in the parking lot of the Orange County Board of Supervisors and, you know, and it, it's a, it's a big facility that, that whole, it's like a campus. We get there and I go, hey, John, we're here. And all of a sudden I look up and you're on the balcony, you know, kind of yelling down to us. And I don't know if you threw water balloon at me at that time, but it was, uh, that was a kind of fun, playful relationship. I mean, you, and I, I don't think I was more special than anybody, but you kind of kept that type of personal relationship with all of the council members and mayors. And, um, you know, we were always very appreciative of the kind of human aspect of kind of what you did there. And, um, but, uh, you know, as you got done uh, with your uh, time in the county supervisor job, talk just a little bit about your move up to the state Senate, because, you know, what they people tell me is that the county supervisor job is one of the best jobs because you can wake up in the morning and go into the office. But when you move up into the state, either in the assembly or into the Senate, you have to get on a plane every week and go up there. What, what was uh, what was your motivation uh, for running into, uh, you know, state uh, and state Senate? So first, uh, since we've had a, a relationship, and uh, and I do like to tease and, and goof, I, I, I will I, I will first ask you to forgive me for <laughs> frustrating you by calling you a loser, um, <laughs> because I would look back at the bankruptcy and and say, man, that was the best yeah. election I ever lost. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. But I have lost elections, and I, I know how painful it is. So yeah. if I hurt your feelings, I apologize. Oh, it no. was meant to be in in, yeah. in, in jest. I um, I was because of the bankruptcy, uh, supervisors were limited to two terms. Uh, so yeah, eight years goes by pretty quickly. It's kind of sad because by that time you actually know everybody. Mm -hmm. You know, you know every department head and probably one or two people below. So you can get things done. Uh, county supervisor is really amazing because uh, Orange County, with its three plus million people, has a population that's uh, equal to or greater than 20 states. Well, we are, for all intents and purposes, we have, we're a state. Mm -hmm. uh, we have, uh, you know, 600,000 constituents each as supervisors and, you know, and we have the, uh, in the relationship with all the cities in our, in our district. So it was, uh, it was a incredible job. You only, you only had five people on the board. So you only had to mm -hmm. deal with four of them. And, mm -hmm. you know, we have the Brown Act, so you have to be careful how many people you, you talk to, but if you wanted to get things done, it wasn't, you know, that difficult. Mm -hmm. But you know the, the the terms ran ran up, and uh, um, Mimi Walters decided to um, uh, to to run for Congress, and she got elected, which opened her Senate seat at the state level. At the yeah. state level, and it wasn't as if I, I really wanted to. There was already an assemblyman uh, Republican from Orange County running. Uh, his name was Don or is Don Wagner. He's now county supervisor, mm -hmm. you know, so things are interesting. Um, but I, I, I started getting um, requests from people I respected. They said, you know, you, you ought to run. Mm -hmm. You ought to run. And I said, well, you know, it's not that there's anything wrong with the candidate already out there. So I, I met with the party chair uh, with the central committee. At that time, it was Scott Baugh. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I said, uh, I'm I'm being asked to run. What, what do you think? And 
you would expect the answer to have been, well, we've already got Don Wagner and he's in the assembly and, you know, you ought to stand down and think about, you know, an opportunity down the road. Now, he says, John, we need your voice. We need your voice up there. So I did not get the no. Mm. So I, I moved forward and I, I pulled papers. And uh, it was interesting uh, because of my name ID. I, I, I wasn't too concerned. Uh, uh, I felt that we should do, do well. I had done a poll uh, for the congressional race that mm. Mimi uh, ran for. Uh, and I polled really well. So I wasn't too concerned. Uh, I was already behind because he had, uh, Don had already raised like 750,000. I had, you know, had to start from nothing. Mm -hmm. And no major Democrats jumped in. So it was just me and him. And then, and then there was a gamesmanship. One of uh, Dana Rohrbacher's, Congressman Rohrbacher's staff decided to jump in, sort of a, you know, like pool votes kind of, kind of a game. But uh, we um, we had a, a primary on March seventeenth, twenty fifteen, and yeah, I had to get fifty percent plus one to win that night. If I didn't, then the top two would go to a general in May. And so, like the first round, I was like at forty seven percent, and then the second round, you know how these things yeah. go on. Like yeah. tonight, the registrar slowly releases votes, but by the the last. The last release of votes, I was at like 51.1%. So the room at nuts and <laughs> I had one and I got teased up in Sacramento of, of becoming a, a senator uh, with no assembly required, oh, you know, because oh, okay. usually, yeah. you know, people make the move up. Yeah. So I, I, I show up in the Senate. Yes, you, you have to travel. You know, I have to get on a, a Southwest uh, flight every Monday morning and then come home every Thursday evening, uh, which, you know, sometimes uh, once you fly enough, you get to have, you know, uh, you, uh, you can have uh, your spouse fly free, which is nice from mm -hmm. Southwest. Uh, but uh, it was, you know, it was difficult, but it was it was kind of interesting to be uh, in the state legislature, being a California historical landmark, yep. you know, a person to all of a sudden now I'm on the red carpet in Sacramento was really, uh, really amazing. Uh, but I was in the super minority. I mean, we, 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 we had 14 states senators that were Republicans when I arrived, which allowed us to stop bills that required a two thirds vote. If so, so 14 to 40, right? Right. Yeah. But, uh, uh, the Democrats and the unions just kept picking us off. Mm. You know, I got, I had to run again in, 2016, and I did not have a strong opponent, so I I, I beat the Democrat, uh, and then uh, and then in 2020, you know, I was I had this massive target on my back because I'd I'd gone after mm -hmm. I'd gone after everybody <laughs> in the unit, yeah. and 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 regretfully for California, uh, it is run by public employee unions. They uh, spend a, a boatload of money on mm -hmm. campaigns. And 90% of the money they spend is for Democrat candidates. So you get some incredible progressive liberal mm -hmm. people running California. We're a very blue state. And it's very difficult for a Republican to, to get elected, uh, even in now in Orange County. Mm -hmm. So in 2020, I had uh, uh, a, a Democrat from nowhere, just a professor, a law professor from UCI, no track record, no nothing other than he had run for Congress and had already showed everybody that he wanted to be a congressperson and, and lost to Katie Porter. But uh, it was, it, but, but I, you know, you talked about raising 700000 and you know how difficult that is, the yeah. phone calls and the events. Non and stop. It's just all day long, every yeah. week, every, you know, no, no rest. But I raised $2.4 million. Wow. And, and the unions gave my opponent, David Min, $6.4 million. And so the mail pieces just kept coming and coming, and it was hard to to respond. And and when you you have innuendo and 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 things that aren't true, and it just keeps coming and pounding and pounding. I I thought I thought the brand was strong enough, but by the uh, by the time the votes were tallied, I was like you know mm -hmm. 
forty nine point five to fifty one point. You know, it was just yeah. really, it was really close. Right on the edge. And then you, and then you're, just, it's yeah. over. Boom, yeah. you're done. Yeah. They don't, uh, you know, give you a party or anything. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, uh, no. But I, it was a great experience. I had six years in, in Sacramento, and I, I felt like I'd, I'd, I'd had an impact as much as a Republican in the mm-hmm. super minority can have. Right. Uh, let me ask you this. So once you finish your public service, that was 20, it's 2024. Um, I, you know, I, I, well, I'm still, 21, 2020, 20, 20, 20, 20, yeah, 20 yeah. the election, but the yeah, 21 you're out. Um, I, I, I follow you. I see that you still do a lot of, uh, publications. You, you write, uh, Epic times. There's a couple different things. And I know you're involved right now with the California policy center, um, you know, as we kind of get towards the end of this, I was just kind of curious, like your outlook of California, um, you know, when you you get involved, uh, you know, one of the things that you do and I follow because I'm a finance guy and I love it is like you follow all the city reports for all the cities across California and um, almost like what a, a controller would do for the state of California to try and keep an eye on, you know, transparency and, we're, you know, the financial state of these cities and how secure they are. Um what 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 do you see for the future of California? What are you, are you looking at mainly from a financial lens now, or do you do you see hope, or do you see um, even tougher times ahead at this point? When I was uh, in a supervisor, I was chairman of the board uh, in two years, uh, 20, oh, 2008 and two thousand twelve, and in two thousand twelve we were going into uh, major. Uh, contract negotiations at the bargaining table with the majority of our uh, uh, employee unions. And so I just wanted to know where is Orange County? I mean, mm-hmm. you know, financially, are we strong or, you know, what? what? And so I, I, I acquired all of the 2010 financial reports, the ACFERS from the 58 counties. I, could, I couldn't get MODOCs. Some municipalities just take forever to get their accounting done. It's one of my pet peeves. But uh, And so when we looked at the 58 counties and, and we looked at their unrestricted net position, which is their owner's equity, yep. you know, you're a businessman. So if, if your owner's equity is negative, you are a bankruptcy candidate. Mm-hmm. Uh, you have more debt than you have in assets. So uh, and, and you take that unrestricted net position, and you divide it by the population. It's just a little simple metric. But it showed that Orange County was in 46th place and out of 58 counties. And and so I was able to communicate to the unions, hey, you know, you can walk in and ask for big pay raises, but hey, we're still not Mm -hmm. where we we need to be. We're at the bottom of the list. We're not near the top. So we're we, we we have you know kind of keep that in mind. So I I I pulled that strategy, and I and I, I kind of kept doing it and said where's where's the county every year, uh, where are cities in the county where, you know where are the cities in the state, and did that when I was a state senator uh, because every level of government has a different form of revenue sources. Mm-hmm. Uh, California has personal income tax. Uh, Orange County. Ninety-two percent is property tax. Cities, it's a combination, and here is California benefiting from one little region called Silicon Valley, which is generating a, a boatload of personal income tax. Mm-hmm. But not so, you know. That money doesn't go down to the county and and, and city level. So, uh, you know, counties sort of, you know, like Orange County right now kind of in good shape because prices of homes have gone up. So when there's turnover, it's a real positive thing. It's just kind of hard to figure out how people are going to be paying these property taxes year in, year out as, mm-hmm. as they go. So, but, but I just wanted to give uh, the state a, a picture of school districts and cities and how they were having difficulties. And if they were having big difficulty, it was because the public employee unions run in those little cities had, had been too aggressive in getting benefits and created a very large liabilities for the pension and for, for what we call other post-employment benefits. Mm-hmm. So it was just, which is retiree medical, but it's just a way to kind of communicate. Mm-hmm. You know, this, this is, this is um, a, a, a simple two numbers. I'm agnostic. It's just, mm-hmm. what is your population? What is your 
donor's equity mm -hmm. and what's the per capita? Mm -hmm. And then you can say, here's number one to here's number 482. And, you know, where, where does your city rank? And, you know, what do you need to do for your city council, you know, to say, hey, we need to get more finance people on board. So that, that's that been an interesting tool. So to give two stories on California, the first is, is that it has been extremely tardy in getting out this financial statement. You're supposed to get a statement out within six months of the end of the fiscal year. So for June 30, 2022, almost two years ago, it should have been done by December 31st of 22. But the state auditor and state controller didn't release the 22 financials until just a few weeks ago. Wow. And what that financial report showed was astounding. Uh, 47 states in this country improved their unrestricted net position. They moved, they moved up, mostly thanks to the CARES Act, where the federal government infused a lot of cash into the states. But for California, it fell back $47 billion, mostly due to an employment development department that was run shoddily. And the second story is that because we're dependent on personal income tax, 1% of the population in California, out of 4, 40 million people, 1% provide half of the personal income tax revenues. That's crazy. But it's, it, it's this, yeah. this 1%. Yeah. And, and, and Gavin Newsom has been an incompetent financial manager. Mm. He's been so excited about every year the revenue's going up. But, you know, when you have revenues exceeding the mean, you should be saying something like, you know, I better be careful. I better not spend it all. Mm -hmm. I should use some of that new revenue that, you know, that is higher than what we should be getting. We should be, we should be reducing pension debt. Mm -hmm. We should be reducing retiree medical debt. State of California owes over $90 million in, not many billions, excuse me, $90 billion in, 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 for retiree medical. I mean, if you had to pay it today. Uh, and, and he didn't do that. And he, he spent the money like he was going up Silly Hill. Mm -hmm. So here we are seeing the, the revenue from our one percenters going down rather dramatically. The revenues are down. So he's got all these programs that he's put in place that still have to be funded. And he's still got the same amount of debt. Mm -hmm. In fact, it's worse because of the uh, uh, the unemployment insurance that he's paid out, that he he borrowed the money from the feds. Now, when you borrow the money from the federal government, uh, employers in this state have to pay what's called FUTA, uh, Federal Unemployment Tax Act. And it's just a small amount, like 0.7% of 7,000, the first 7,000 wages. So you pay like $56 an employee. But if the state doesn't pay its debt to the federal government, the federal government puts in a much higher rate. Newsom didn't correct this yeah. kind of thing. He had a lousy employment development department. If you look at the org chart, it's right up below him. Yeah. And, and so now here we are with such a significant debt. So by reviewing the annual comprehensive financial reports, Reading the small print, I found that. I found that, you know, and I was the first one to release that information. The LA Times didn't cover this concern until, not until yesterday. Mm -hmm. It was in the Sunday Times that they finally realized what's going on with the Employment Development Department. So this, all to say, Troy, I'm getting a little, you know, emotional, but the state's in pretty bad shape. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to get to, John. It's like, um, you know, you and I both have a lot of friends that have left, you know, moved on. And, you know, I think some of us, um, I mean, I'm not as dedicated to go to all the California historical monuments as you are, but I, I, you know, my family's here. I, you know, I've, I've started a lot of businesses here, um, you know, and I, I would like to try to see about how we can improve it. But structurally, you know, it's hard to argue. And if you are theoretically in that 1%, a lot of my 1% friends are leaving for sure. Um, and by the way, they actually create a lot of jobs. And so I guess in closing, John, like um, longer term, when you look at any prescriptions, 
Anything that you would like just leave with some simple thing. People that are looking that are in California that, that look in, you see, why are these two guys still here if they're, you know, going through this? But, you know, we definitely see that if it was that bad, we would leave. So what's your prescription? Yeah. And, and I, I would say that uh, because we have seven grandkids and they're all here in California, mm -hmm. uh, it would make it difficult, you know, to leave. Uh, but prescriptions um, are, are, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll put them out there, even though they might be, you know, high reaches. But, mm -hmm. but the first thing is that uh, we need to get more Republicans elected to public office in this state. Uh, it's out of balance. So I think voters need to be a little more uh, aware that we, we need uh, more of a balance in the state legislature. So we've got to be much more, you know, proactive in getting some better finance brains uh, and, and more balance uh, into the legislature and even into our city councils and into our um, school boards. Mm. Um, we need uh, to start thinking much differently about how we treat the one percenters. When I was calling one of my donors, I said, you're in, you're in Henderson, Nevada. And said, you you know, your wife maxed out to me. She sent me a check for 4,900 bucks. Mm -hmm. I said, why, why? He says, well, he says, you know, I own businesses in, in Orange County, California, and in Nevada and Arizona. And my CPAs told me that if I stayed in California, it was going to cost me $10,000 a day. So, you know, take a year and I could buy a three and a half million dollar mm -hmm. <laughs> home here in Henderson. And, and so it was like, so, so yeah, you could see the one percentage were going. So we, we need to get uh, uh, an education on what is happening with our taxing system. Mm -hmm. uh, the LA times covered that as well, a little bit uh, on Monday with the George Skelton's uh, column, but, but we, we, we need to modify our, our, our personal income tax structure to encourage uh, the one percenters to stay and maybe even to attract them from across the other side of the Sierras because mm -hmm. they're looking at us and they're going, we don't need to cross the Sierras to, right. you know, we, there might be a marketplace out there, but mm -hmm. uh, it, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense. And, and we've got to start cutting the, the problem with a state that is run by public employee unions is that they are very fast to expand and higher, but they are slow to contract and lay off. But we're going to have to make some serious layoffs in Sacramento. Yeah, it's just, mm -hmm. you know, and 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 it's going to be very hard for someone like uh, um, Newsom because he has aspirations maybe to be president. I mean, it, he certainly you know signals it all mm -hmm. the time, and so he needs public employee union money to do that. Right. And so it's going to be very difficult for him to make layoffs, but it has to be done. I was chairman of the board of Orange County Supervisors in 2008, the worst year to be chairman of the board. Yep. We laid off a thousand people. It was awful. It was difficult, but that's what we needed to do. That was just, that's what you do in the business world. Yep. That's what you got to do in, in the public sector. And, and so that's going to be very difficult for, for, for Gavin to do, but that's what he has to do. Uh, he's already messed up things. And it's, it's, it's really his fault. He should have taken one half of the increase in revenues and he should have been putting that into paying down debt, you know, so that at least in a, in a, in a, in a tough cycle, we at least don't have the same credit card debt, you know, it's like you still, and, and so he's going to have to take some very difficult, uh, uh, uh actions. Mm -hmm. And so by May 15th, you know, he's got to put together the revise. And so in a few weeks, we're going to have some real interesting times. The legislature has to vote for a budget by June 15, uh, or they don't get paid. So they have real incentives. Mm -hmm. But what it has done, it has bastardized the, the budget process. So now we get something called a final budget, but we get budget trailer bills for months afterwards to, to you know, so it, that that has to stop. I mean, we have to. Mm -hmm. really do a budget and not, mm -hmm. you know, this budget mash that, you know, is just, just, you know, so there's a lot of stuff that needs to be improved, but, you know, it's going to have to take 
some different people with different thinkings. Mm -hmm. You can't just do every silly little program you want. We have to figure out what is our core business and and stick to the core and and quit expanding and reaching and trying to solve every little problem there is. Yeah. Well, John, you know, I've always, uh, the thing I've always appreciated with you is uh, you're a data guy. And so, you know, when we start going through this, I think uh, a lot of times I talk to people and it's the Socratic method, right? You've put the data in front of just anybody and they can read it for themselves uh, whether they're partisan or not, I think that the data starts to speak is that there is a, a very dire you know, thing going on here in the state. You know, I, I think what what I've really enjoyed about the discussion today is, you know, really trying to look at it from a proactive perspective. You know, um, you know, the easy thing is to pack up and move and to, to move on. And um, I, I love the fact that you're still in the game. You're still focused on trying to, to find the root causes and, and using, you know, uh, one of my best friends, is, his saying is data sets you free, right? It's, um, you know, wh whether you like mm -hmm. it or not, um, you can have emotions, but the data won't lie. And um, John, thank you so much for coming down here. And, uh, and you know, I almost feel like uh, this has been long overdue as uh, the brotherhood of being able to spend time together. And I, I just really appreciate seeing you and, uh, and hearing what you're up to. And thank you for, for sharing your, your story today. Well, thank you, Troy. And thank you for letting me be a little more candid than normal. I know you're really balanced uh, with your show. And, and uh, forgive me for being a little partisan. But, but having had a front row seat in Sacramento for yep. six years, you kind of get a little irritated uh, mm -hmm. by it all. And so uh, thank you for letting me be a little candid uh, yeah. because you are a brother. Yeah, no, I appreciate it, John. Well, thank you, and I, I wish you the very best. Thanks again for joining me today on the Ameritocracy Show. Be sure to follow me on social media and our website at troyedgar.com, where you can get more information and sign up for my weekly email. I hope you have a great week.